my screens. It's like on my other screen. <laughs> All right. So Dara Johnson Tracy is a fellow lawyer. Um, she is a shareholder and co-founder of the law firm Horn and Johnson SC in Madison, Wisconsin. She focuses her legal practice on Sorry, I'm the worst introductor introducer right now. She focuses her <laughs> legal practice in the areas of estate planning, probate, and adult guardianship. Dara is top rated by super lawyers and has been a featured presenter at various conferences, both nationally and throughout Wisconsin. So sorry, I was trying to like look at the screen while I was talking. So I was moving my, my thing around and it, I lost it for a second. So I apologize for that, but welcome Dara and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I was mentioning when we went out in the breakout room, I, I see so many familiar faces and names in this group. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. So I am going to share my screen, Erin, if that's okay. All right. Yep, you should be able to just go ahead and do that. All right. Let's see. Can everybody see my presentation? Looks good. Good. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to have a super exciting time talking about um, death, disability, and taxes today. I'm sure everybody's looking forward to that. And so um, those of you who know me might remember that my license plate says death and taxes. So I am very dedicated to estate planning. Um, so I actually started my legal career back in 1994 when I went to work for a general practitioner as a paralegal down in Texas, which is where I'm from. I realized very quickly that I loved everything about the law, um, but I'm not a litigator. And so in 1998, I moved to Madison and I found my passion for death, disability, and taxes. Um, there was a 10-year stretch there where I worked full-time during the day as a paralegal and I went to school at night. Um, but the beauty of that is by the time I graduated from Marquette Law School in 2008, I had 14 years of experience working as a paralegal and I knew exactly what I wanted to do, what my practice area was going to be so I was really able to hit the ground running. Um, so this is my family. So this is me and my husband, Brandon. Some of you know him as well, Brandon Tracy. Um, he owns and operates Superhero Martial Arts, which is um, a, a martial arts academy where he works at this point exclusively with um, children and younger adults who have various special needs. And so he's, unfortunately, he's had to shut down for the time being, but hopefully at some point in the foreseeable future, he'll be able to open up again. Um, and then over on the left-hand side is my oldest, Darian. She's 26 years old. She lives out in college. Colorado. She's learning to adult. She's getting better every year. Um, in fact, this year she asked for a vacuum cleaner for her birthday. I was very impressed with that. Um, it shows some major adulting. <laughs> and then our little one, Layla, she's eight. Um, so yes, I, I like my children one at a time, 18 years apart. That has worked best for me. <laughs> the reason I introduce you to my family at the beginning of a presentation about estate planning is because as we're talking about estate planning today, um, I'd like everyone to keep in mind that estate planning isn't really about you. Right. I mean, it, it can provide peace of mind for sure, but really it's about those who you leave behind. It's about your loved ones, making sure you don't leave a mess to clean up when you're gone. And all of our families look different, right? Sometimes we have traditional families. Sometimes we have blended families like my own. Um, sometimes we have minor children. Sometimes we have beneficiaries with special needs, elderly parents, charities. And so every estate plan is very different and it's going to be based on your particular circumstances. So according to Rock, at lawyer still for the past decade this has been true over half of american adults have no estate plan in place so if you have nothing you are actually not so much in the minority i think the reason one of the main reasons that so many people don't have anything is because um, there's there's a myth that estate planning is just for very wealthy people you think well if i don't have an estate i don't really need an estate plan but you know that couldn't be further from the truth because everyone needs something you you could be worth zero and still need someone to make your healthcare decisions. So everyone over the age of 18 needs something in place. Um, in fact, if you have children who are over the age of 18 and they don't have basic healthcare documents and a HIPAA authorization, if they're in some kind of an accident or if they're, you know, in the COVID ward, you, you don't have any access to their information and you have no decision-making authority. So everyone needs something. I think Terry Schiavo will continue to serve as a shining example of that. I don't know if you remember her. It's been a while, right? But she was a young lady down south in her 20s. She 
was married and she unexpectedly became mentally incapacitated. Um, the issue there was that her husband said, there's no way my wife would wanna be kept alive like this, much less have her face plastered all over the media. And her parents said, no, we wanna keep our daughter alive as long as possible, whatever that means. Well, after seven years in court, the judge finally let Terry go, right? So again, if Terry had had something in place, even basic healthcare documents, we wouldn't even know her name today. It's just that important. Um, so the goals of estate planning are gonna look different for everyone. Of course, we need to plan for the present. And really that's all we can do. So often I have people come to me and they say, well, Dara, I don't, you know, I don't know what, you know, my, my parents, maybe they're good guardians right now, but what if they're not in 10 years because they're getting older? That's okay. All we can do is plan based on today's circumstances and then review every few years, because of course things are gonna change as kids get older, family members get older, your siblings, your parents. Um, so we have to review. And of course you need to plan for incapacity, right? Right? So a will, which we're going to learn today, isn't all you need. You also have to cover what if you're incapacitated or what if you're in the COVID ward for a few weeks, who has the authority to take care of things and plan for death, what happens when you're gone. And sometimes maybe we need to avoid probate and save taxes. Now, I'm just right now going to briefly touch on the estate tax situation. Currently, as of today, you could pass over $11.5 million to your loved ones without paying any estate taxes. But and there's a big but here. Um, Wisconsin, federal, everybody's, of course, all the governments are in a budget crisis right now because of the coronavirus situation. And, and, and they're gonna be, they already are looking for money. So I do fully expect the estate tax situation to change in the foreseeable future. I just don't see a way around it. But as of right now, $11.5 million. Um, so when you think about, when we're talking about your estate, my definition of an estate is gonna look different from your financial advisors, right? Because I'm looking at your death value. And so we're gonna look at the value of all real estate you have. We're gonna look at any cash or investments you have. We're gonna look at retirement plans, even if you haven't, started taking distributions yet. That's still an asset of your estate. Um, we're going to look at all your stuff, your jewelry, your electronics, and the death value of your life insurance. So that's something many people don't consider. But if you die, that's a chunk of money. If you have life insurance, that is certainly part of your estate. So for many of us, we're worth more dead than alive. That's okay. That's completely normal. But you've got to include all of these assets for estate planning purposes. So there are some essential estate planning documents everyone needs to have in place. And this is whether you're 20 or 90, unless you can guarantee me you're never gonna die or become incapacitated, we have to cover some basics. Um, so you need to have a property power of attorney in place. Um, this is a document that is always important, but with COVID it's even more important now than it used to be. This is a document where you give someone the authority to manage all financial matters for you when you can't do that for yourself. Someone needs to sign tax returns, manage retirement plans, social security payments, credit cards, utility companies, um, leases, mortgage companies, all of that. If you, and in Wisconsin, your spouse does not automatically have the ability to do that for you unless you have a comprehensive property power of attorney in place. It's also known as a financial power of attorney or a durable power of attorney. They all mean the same thing, but this document is essential, especially now. Um, also, you need a health care power of attorney in place. So important for everyone. You've got to designate the person who's authorized to make your decisions for you if you can't do that for yourself. And again, in Wisconsin, your spouse does not automatically have the ability to make those decisions for you. Unfortunately, I've handled plenty of guardianship proceedings for spouses because they didn't have these power of attorney documents in place for each other. And now one is mentally incapacitated and we have to go to court. Uh, most people also prefer to include living will language as well. And that's where you indicate whether or not it's okay to let you go. If you're in a terminal condition where death is imminent or a persistent vegetative state where there's no measurable brain activity, it basically gives permission to your family to let you go under those circumstances. Um, and HIPAA, so important. Again, 
always important, so much more now during, during COVID. Um, this provides a list of individuals who are legally authorized to call the hospital, see if you're there, um, find out what room you're in, find out what your condition is. And the HIPAA authorizations you sign at your doctor's offices, I'd encourage you to read the fine print there. Um, number one, they're only going to be valid for that particular network. So if you're out of town, they're not going to do any good. You probably only named one person, if you're married, probably your spouse, which means no one else can access that information information. And those forms typically expire every year. So if you don't sign a new one at just the right time, there might be at a period where not even your spouse has the authority to call the hospital and get information. Um, so again, always important. And again, I mentioned at the beginning, if you have adult children, you should strongly consider making sure that they have some of these documents in place as well, just in case. Um, Wisconsin makes it very easy to make specific distributions of personal property. So um, not everyone, but many people, they have, you know, family heirs looms or jewelry or electronics, whatever it might be, and they want to make sure those items go to specifically designated individuals. Um, please don't be the person who puts stickers on everything around the house. You don't know how many times I've seen families argue about the darn stickers. Please, if you're going to make those distributions, let's do it in a way um, that, that is legally enforceable. So as long as your will or your trust specifically incorporates what we call a personal property memorandum, it's got to have the right language in there to be enforceable. You can just make a list in your own handwriting. You describe the asset, name the individual, sign and date each page, and it's completely valid. And that way you don't have to see your estate planning attorney every time you change your mind about a piece of jewelry or furniture or something like that, because you have the ability to update that on your own. Um, and then funeral planning. So this is another area that's often overlooked. And again, whether you're 20 or 90, um, I think everyone should write down their funeral wishes. This is the first opportunity for families to fight about something, especially in blended families. But if you've written down your wishes very specifically in your own handwriting, and we sign a funeral authorization, in Wisconsin it's called an authorization for final disposition designating the person who you trust to follow through with those wishes, we can take that argument off the table, right? But the key is you want to designate the right person. So for example, if you wanted to be cremated, and you wanted to have a simple celebration of life, but you know that certain family members would insist on giving you a $20,000 church funeral or vice versa, we don't name that family member, right? We name the one who we know is gonna follow through with your wishes. So again, very important to keep peace in the family in case something happens to you. And then last but certainly not least, a will or a living trust, which is what most people think about when they think about estate planning, right? So let's, let's explore wills. Let's talk about what they do and what they don't accomplish. So what your will does is if you have minor children, it's the only place in Wisconsin where you can designate legally nominate guardians for those minor children, so important. Um, it also designates your personal representative, the executor, the person who's in charge after you're gone of making sure all the final debts and expenses get paid, uh, making sure the final tax returns are filed and making sure everything plays out legally. And it also establishes how your assets will be distributed upon your death. Right. And we're going to talk about um, in a moment how beneficiary designations and joint ownership might affect this. Um, but whatever goes through your will is distributed according to the provisions of your will. And within your will, you can create what we call a testamentary trust. A testamentary trust is a trust that springs into existence through the will after you're gone. So, you know, for example, if you have a 19 year old child, you probably don't want that 19 year old to get hundreds of thousands of dollars in life insurance with no strings attached, right? Technically he might be an adult, but he's probably not ready. So a will can accomplish that, but we're also gonna talk about trusts momentarily. What a will does not do is it does not provide for mental incapacity. So if all you have is a will, and you have nothing else that's not enough because it doesn't have any effect until you're gone. Another thing that a will does not do is it does not avoid death probate. And that's confusing to people, right? Because they think, well, I went to an attorney's office. I signed this will. I had it legally prepared. I had witnesses and notaries. Why on earth would this be subject to a court proceeding? Well, if you have a will and you're depending on that will to transfer your assets, the only way to activate that will to, to make sure everything is distributed is by initiating a probate proceeding. Um, so 
it, it's not the end of the world. And honestly, I'd much rather see your life insurance go through an organized probate proceeding to get to trusts that we set up for your kids than having you know minor children inherit life insurance. That's not in anyone's best interest, but it is a pain for whoever's in charge. Um, I don't know, for those of you who have had to deal with probate for parents or grandparents, you might recall, on average, it takes about a year. Um, because of COVID, the courts are a little weird right now, which the other attorneys in this group, I'm sure can, can confirm everybody's working from home and doing Zoom hearings and things like that. So 12 to 18 months in probate. Um, and also, whenever you, you designate, let's say you disinherit a child in your will, or another family member who would otherwise be legally entitled to inherit, that disinherited family member is legally entitled to get a copy of your will and an invitation to court to come object to it. Um, it's just kind of like throwing, you know, fanning the flames of a fire. So even if you've disinherited someone, they must still receive a copy and the records are ultimately open to the public, right? So um, I wouldn't want some guy to go online and see that my 26 year old daughter inherited money. Uh, which is why I wouldn't necessarily want to depend on a will for her because somebody could type in her name through the circuit court access system and find out how much she inherited, names, addresses, et cetera. So for those reasons, plus it's expensive, many people choose to avoid the death probate process. So how do we wind up in probate? So just as a reminder, assets that pass according to your will or according to the laws of intestacy, that means you don't have anything in place, no will, no trust, the state has decided in statutes how your assets will be distributed. So basically, if you're married and you share all of your children with your spouse and you have nothing in place, everything would go to your spouse. If you have a blended family, your spouse keeps his or her marital half, essentially, and the other half is divided among your children. If you're not married, everything goes to your children. If you don't have any children, then we go parents. And then if your parents are gone, siblings and then nieces and nephews, and we branch out until we find the closest blood relatives. So the assets that are distributed this way or according to your will, if you have one, are assets you die with that are titled solely in your name with no beneficiary. Um, also, if you've named your estate as the beneficiary of an asset, then it will be subject to the terms of the will and probate. So how do we avoid probate? Well, one way is through joint tenancy. Um, so for example, if you own, we'll take your home as an example, and you own that jointly with your spouse, right, as husband and wife, as survivorship marital property, um, when one of you dies, that home is simply going to transfer to your spouse. And so the will has nothing to do with that. If you have joint accounts with your spouse or someone else, typically the those accounts would transfer automatically upon your death. Similarly, if you you have a payable on death known as a POD designation on a bank account, um, then whoever you designated as your POD beneficiary will inherit that account outside of probate. Again, it has nothing to do with your will. Similarly, transfer on death for brokerage accounts, you can designate direct beneficiaries with many institutions, they'll allow you to do that. Um, and then the stocks and bonds would transfer in kind directly to that beneficiary. Again, your will has nothing to do with it, no probate proceeding. And then also, of course, traditional beneficiary designations like beneficiaries on life insurance policies or retirement plans, those assets transfer directly to the beneficiaries. So that sounds great, right? Let's just designate direct beneficiaries on everything and be done with it, but be careful with that. Um, so for example, I mentioned if you have um, children who are my, my oldest daughter's age, you know, pseudo adults, they're adults technically, but maybe they're not ready for an outright inheritance. Maybe you don't wanna designate them directly because there are no strings attached, right? Maybe you have beneficiaries who have financial issues regardless of age. And maybe it's not that they're irresponsible, maybe they have a health condition um, and they're always gonna be in danger of going bankrupt due to medical bills. Maybe there's a better way to leave that money to them so that they won't lose what you leave them to bankruptcy court. And then of course, if you have beneficiaries who have special needs, you have to be careful with that because you don't wanna disqualify them from receiving government benefits that they might otherwise be entitled to for their lifetimes. Um, but don't just inherit them. Goodness, no, we just make sure we set up a trust to make sure those assets are protected, but still there for them. Um, of course, if you have minor beneficiaries, you just, you can never name a minor as a direct beneficiary of anything um, because it's gonna cause a lot of trouble. You'll have to get a legal guardian appointed in the court system. The account will go into a locked account by the court. And then when your child is 18, they get to cash it all out, no strings attached. That'll be fun for a very brief period of time for them. And then when they're 30 or 35, they'll look back and maybe have some regrets. Poor life choices, right? 
And then what about future marriages? So here, I'm not talking at this time about your children's future marriages. I'm talking about your spouse's future marriage after you die. Think about that for a moment. I always tell my husband, it's not that I don't trust him. It's that I don't trust his future wife if I die. So often what happens is if you have simple wills in place, everything just goes to your spouse on the first death through usually through title and through beneficiaries. Um, and then if your spouse gets married after you die, over the years, that new spouse becomes the joint owner of real estate, the beneficiary of retirement plans, life insurance, everything passes to that new spouse who can disinherit your children. Happens all the time, and it's something to at least be aware of when we're looking at estate planning options. Um, so how do we avoid the whole death probate situation? Well, you can name direct beneficiaries on all of your assets, or another alternative is to create a fully funded revocable living trust. Um, so before we talk about living trusts and the general structure, how they work, I'd like to clarify um, different types of trusts because there's a lot of confusion about this. So we mentioned earlier, I mentioned that testamentary trusts are trusts that are created within your will. So if you have created a trust for minor children, for example, within your will, then it springs into existence after you're gone through the will, but it will not avoid a probate proceeding. So your assets will have to go through the probate court system in order to get to the trust that you created within your wills. Um, there are also irrevocable trusts in place. Um, and for irrevocable trusts, they're not um, the best strategy for most people. But for some people, they can be very useful. So for example, let's say, well, I'll give you an example. I have a widow, um, you know, she's in her 70s and she's lived in her house for 40, 50 years. That's where she and her husband raised their kids. It's paid off, but she's living on social security. She knows that if she has to go to a nursing home, um, that she's gonna go on Medicaid and there won't be anything left because you have to spend down your assets to $2,000 before you qualify. So we took her home, we put it into an irrevocable trust she couldn't be the trustee. Her son had to be the trustee, but she can live there for her entire lifetime without paying rent. But we made it past that five-year look-back period. So it was over five years ago. Now, if she ever has to go into a nursing home, um, she can go on Medicaid right away and the house can still pass to her kids. So that's an example of a Medicaid planning trust. Some people use irrevocable trusts for charitable planning um, if they have an estate tax issue and other estate tax planning um, methods. For example, irrevocable life insurance trusts to get life insurance out of the estate for estate tax purposes. But for the vast majority of people who are looking at a trust as an option, a revocable living trust is, is typically going to be the best route to go. It's the most flexible option. It avoids probate if it's properly funded. Now, if you have a living trust in place from 1997 that doesn't have anything in it, you're still not protected because it's not going to avoid probate. So think of a trust as a box, right? So we build this box called your living trust and we put everything in the box. So we, we, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's sitting there holding your assets, waiting for something to happen. But you're in charge of this trust. You're in full control um, because you are the beneficiary. You are the trustee of the trust, the one who's in charge. You're the creator of the trust. You have the power to amend it. So you have full control over this trust. It's even identified by your own social security numbers. There's no taxpayer ID number separately assigned to the trust. So as far as the IRS and the Department of Revenue are concerned, you and your trust are are one and the same. So here's an example of a married revocable living trust. Now keep in mind, as with all estate planning, um, this is just an example. Your, your estate plan is going to look very different based on your individual circumstances. But here we have, um, we have Susan, Susan and David Smith, and they created a trust. Happily married couple, we built this box, their living trust, we put everything in the trust. So their trust owns all of their real estate. Um, quick note, if you own real estate in more than one state, and you don't have a trust in place, there are gonna be multiple probate proceedings. So upon your death, we'll have to have a Wisconsin probate plus ancillary probate proceedings in every single state in which you own property. Something to be aware of anyway, um, but we can solve that with a trust. So all real estate is titled in the name of the trust. Um, we The life insurance designates the trust as the beneficiary. 
personal property is assigned to the trust, future vehicles are purchased in the name of the trust, non-retirement investment assets are assigned to the trust, your bank accounts are in the name of your trust typically. Now your account numbers don't change, your checks don't change. The only difference is when you print out a statement or when you receive a statement, it shows the account is owned by your trust. So it's really just something that happens in the background. Um, for retirement assets, anything that's tax deferred, it's a little bit different because we can't transfer ownership during your lifetime, but that's okay because those are handled through beneficiary designations. So if you're married, typically your spouse is going to be the primary beneficiary. So those accounts can roll over. And then on the second death, the beneficiary would be either, you know, children or your trust um, just depends on the value of the account and the beneficiaries in your trust and their circumstances. So here at the time of the first death, and, and since I'm a woman, of course, I killed off the husband first. So David dies. And here, <laughs> We have two separate trusts that are created in this case. Why would we do that? Well, because if everything just goes to Susan at the time of the first death, um, let's say we have an estate tax issue. So I mentioned right now you can pass 11 and a half million, but what if Wisconsin comes back and says you can only pass 2 million, but with life insurance and real estate, they have two and a half million. Why not give Susan the option at least at the time of the first death to shelter that extra half million so the kids don't have to pay estate taxes? Um, just to give you an idea, when we did have an estate tax in Wisconsin on an estate of one million on the second death, we were paying the state between sixty and seventy thousand dollars. Right, so it's a big chunk there. So again, right now for many of my clients, we have that option at least to to double the amount we can pass to the beneficiaries, and there are other things we can do with that as well. But I won't go into detail at this time during this presentation. So now, when Susan dies, let's say they have three kids: Sarah, Tom, and Diane. Sarah is the responsible child, and so she's the one who's designated as the successor trustee. Um, the difference is with a will, Sarah wouldn't even be able to hire a realtor to sell her mom's house until she went to court, and now we have the whole probate issue. Um, with a trust, it's all private, so she just needs her death certificate, trust document. She can privately, quietly, and quickly take care of everything. Three equal shares for Sarah. She has divorce and creditor protection. She can do whatever she wants with her inheritance, but her husband, if they ever divorce, he's never going to walk away with half. Um, for Tom, he's our irresponsible basement dweller. So for him, we have a professional trustee um, there to help him make good life choices, but the money's always available for him for what he needs. But if he wants a shiny red sports car, it's the trustee's job to say, well, maybe let's look at this Honda instead. Um, and then for Diane, she has some special needs. So we have to be careful there um, with her benefits. So her sister is her trustee. Um, we're going to keep her qualified for everything, but we also make sure the money's available to maintain her standard of living and for whatever she needs as time goes by. So the ultimate moral of my story today is don't be like Prince who had no estate plan in place. He was a major star and a cultural influencer, but he was after all a human being. It comes down to taking care of business. If you don't take care of it, you're leaving a mess to the family or to the courts. And I, I read that Prince's advisors told him repeatedly he needed to have a trust in place, but he told them no, because if I sign an estate plan, if I sign a trust or a will, that means I'm going to die. Well, guess what? He died anyway, right? So again, I go back to my original point in that everyone, whether you're 20 or 90, needs something in place. All right. So I am at this point going to open it up to any questions that you might have.